In your bulletin under the reflection, uh, there is this poem that's also going to be here on the screen. I discovered this poem for the first time some 10 years ago, and I believe I shared it in one of our Ash Wednesday services a while back, but I'd like to share it again. The poem is called Ask Me by William Stafford from his book, The Language of Life. Sometime when the river is ice, ask me mistakes I have made. Ask me whether what I have done is my life. Others have come in their slow way into my thought, and some have tried to help or to hurt. Ask me what difference their strongest love or hate has made. I will listen to what you say. You and I can turn and look at the silent river and wait. We know the current is there, hidden, and there are comings and goings from miles away that hold the stillness exactly before us. What the rivers say, that's what I say. Now I know that there are times when I can be rather dense. And so even after 10 years, I find myself trying to comprehend at times the meaning of this poem. The imagery and words speak so powerfully to me that I've been wrestling with them since I first found them writing. Of course, I think this is true for any great piece of writing, especially poetry. And the part I have wrestled with, the most powerful line for me in Stafford's poem is, ask me whether what I have done is my life. Now on the obvious level, the answer to the question Stafford invites us to ask is yes. Yes, my life is all about what I have done. What other measure for one's life is there than to look at what one has actually accomplished? Even Jesus in Matthew 25 seems to tell us that the truest measure of our lives lies in what we have accomplished, attempted, or done. I was hungry, and you fed me. Thirsty, and you gave me drink. Naked and you clothed me, sick and in prison and you visited me. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But on another level, however, aren't we more than the sum of our actions? Isn't there more to my life than what I have done? I, for one, certainly hope so. Don't our beliefs, convictions, and eternal lives count for anything? Again, Jesus seems to imply as much, especially when it comes to our negative thoughts. For instance, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus equates lust with adultery and hate with murder. And if these negative emotions and intentions count for something, don't our dreams and good intentions matter as well? Ask me what I have done, whether what I have done is my life. That's a haunting thing for most of us to have to answer. Now for some of us, those words will sound ridiculous, the kind of empty words you'd expect from a poet. Obviously my life has been my life. But for others, the words can be penetrating because they ask us to consider whether the lives we are living are the lives we are made for, the lives we have in, it, in us to lead, the deepest, most creative, best lives we could offer, the lives God has called us and expects us to live. Something like this is found in the story about a wise rabbi named Zusia. When Zusia was on his deathbed, he began to cry and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, why do you weep? And Zusia explained, when I get to heaven, I won't be troubled if God asks me, Zeusia, why were you not Abraham? Or Zeusia, why were you not Moses? I could answer those questions. After all, I was not endowed with the righteousness of Abraham or the faith of Moses. But what will I say when God asks me, Zeusia, why were you not Zeusia? Ask me 
whether what I have done is my life. Why were you not Zeusia? Why were you not Will? Or why were you not you? I think about the many babies I've baptized in my ministry, and I wonder if they have been or will be able to live their lives as they were and are meant to live them. Now you may be wondering what brought Stafford's poem and these thoughts to my mind. Well, it was a short line in our reading from 1 Peter. The line where Peter writes, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Now for Peter and the other disciples, those words meant that they were expecting Jesus to return to earth any day. At the very least, they thought that Jesus would return before they died. Of course, after 2,000 years, we know that this was not to be. But in spite of this, there is, I think, a deeper meaning in these words of Peter. For in truth, the end of all things is always near for all of us. No one is immortal. We don't live forever. And like the writer of the poem, we will, all of us, struggle with whether or not we have lived our lives as we should have lived them. The question then becomes, given the brevity of our lives, what do we do with the time we have been given? Well, I think our two readings this morning are a good place to start. In the gospel, we are explicitly told how not to live. In a world filled with anxiety and worry and fear, Jesus tells us that we are not to let these things consume us. Therefore, I tell you, he says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear is not life more than food and body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? And yet how often do we let fear rule our lives? How much time and energy do we waste being anxious and worrying about things we have little or no control over? If you're like me, then it's way too much. We have so little faith, so little trust in God. And if in the gospel Jesus tells us what not to do, then in his letter Peter tells us what we ought to be doing. As Peter says in our reading from his letter, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same intention so as to live for the rest of your earthly lives no longer by human desires, but by the will of God. And what is the will of God? Peter tells us that it is simply this. Be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant love for one another for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you have received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. Loving, caring, serving. It's as simple and as hard as that. If we can but love one another, care for each other, and serve others through our words and deeds, then God will be glorified in our lives through Christ who lives within us. And I'm going to make it even easier. 
If remembering to love, care, and serve is too much, then let me summarize even more. It's a favorite story of mine from Frederick Beekner. I know I've shared before, but I share it here in my last sermon at Coventryville. Frederick Beekner tells the story of Henry James, who was once saying farewell to his nephew Billy long ago at a train station. James was not known for putting things very clearly or succinctly, but he did both on this day, and it was something the boy never forgot. What James said was this, there are three things that are important in human life. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. The third is to be kind. And as Beekner adds, be kind because although kindness is not by a long shot the same thing as holiness, kindness is one of the doors that holiness enters the world through us. Love, care, and serve one another. Or just be kind. For God's sake. For the sake of each other. For the sake of the world. Be kind. For you see the gospel is this. We have come to know the love of God in Christ. We have experienced the kindness of God. How much God cares for us. Through the life of Jesus. And we have seen the links that God will go to to show us this love and kindness. And in the time remaining, we are called to show the same kindness in our lives that God has shown to us. If I can do this, then when I come to the end, I will be able to say, yes, what I have done is my life. And I have lived it well. Yes, I have been the person God has called me to be. I have been the will God wanted me to be. And the same will be true for you as well. Amen.